Hello and welcome everyone to another exciting week of Chiral's educational training series. I'm Honey Sagari, founder and CEO of Chiral, and I'm so excited for tonight's webinar where we dive into weight loss strategies for maximizing weight loss, burning fat, retaining muscle, and so much more. If you're currently taking semi-glutide or tirzepatide, this tonight is an absolute must watch. Just so you all know, I recently attended a seminar hosted by A4M and Dr. Lavelle, and it was so good, so enlightening. I knew I had to bring it to all of you guys. So I reached out to A4M and Dr. Lavelle, explained what we're trying to do here at Chiral as a company, how we're trying to educate our consultants, uh, teach you guys, share with you as much information and knowledge. And they were gracious enough to allow us to bring this to all of you tonight. So thank you, A4M and Dr. LaBelle. Uh, some of the information here is a little high level. It's very medical. It's okay if you don't understand everything. I'm a biochemist and I don't understand it all, but it's okay. Let it absorb. Just take what you can. And I guarantee by the end of it, um, you'll be well equipped to talk about GLP-1s, GIPs, especially some of the peptides mentioned. I am absolutely rushing to get my hands on these peptides because they sound life-changing. And over the weekend, I attended another peptide conference, um, same peptides were mentioned over and over again. So I'm like, oh my gosh, there's so much power in peptides that no one's really talking about. So I'm glad Dr. Laval mentions it tonight and he can share some of that with all of you. Um, a little about tonight's guest, Dr. Laval sits on the A4M Scientific Committee, and that's where I was introduced to him, as well as being chair of the International Peptide Society. Jim is an internationally recognized clinical pharmacist, naturopath doctor, author, and board-certified clinical nutritionist with over 35 years of clinical experience. Wow. Jim is best known for his expertise in performance health and in integrative care with personally seeing thousands of clients over the years. He has an extensive background in natural products, lifestyle drugs, nutrient depletion, and uncovering the underlying metabol metabolic issues that keep people from feeling healthy and vital. He's developed programs for several industries, including fitness, professional sports teams, and healthcare companies. Most recently, Jim was appointed the clinical director for the Pro Football Hall of Fame Performance Health Program. He is the founder of the Metabolic Code Enterprise, a cloud-based assessment tool that helps to pinpoint where the metabolic roadblocks are to a person's health based on their symptoms, survey, lab markers, biometric, and wearable data. Jim is the author of more than 20 books, 16 eBooks, and he's authored over 200 articles as well as being published in peer review literature. I mean, he is an absolute legend uh, in the integrative medicine world, along with uh, peptide therapy. He's at the forefront. I am so excited to be able to bring this to all of you. Thank you again to A4M and Dr. Laval. Without further ado, please enjoy tonight's presentation. This whole seminar was put together because of the issues around, you know, gee, is semi good? Is trisepatide good? Are people losing just lean mass and no fat mass? But more importantly, it's how can you start to use, you know, compounds, um, which are peptides like trisepatide, like uh, semi-glutide, and then be able to preserve lean, ma lean mass at the same time. So what other things can you do? So we're going to jump in. We're going to get going. And uh, let's see if we can learn something in the next hour or two. And uh, let, let's see what we get it going. All right. So first of all, the big thing about your metabolism is you got to understand what's blocking it, right? Look, if you're just going to put people on semaglutide and, you know, they're still not sleeping, they're still stressed out, uh, they're still, you know, whatever they do eat, it still ends up being too carby. They, you know, they, they've got environmental burden, whatever it is. If they've got issues, could be hormones, right? If they have issues that are metabolic disruptors to their metabolism, the goal is to try to create strategies that cut off that excess inflammatory signaling that is probably pretty important in terms of the overall reason that person has gained weight. And look, 
Look, we don't have to look around too far, right? We got 50% of the U.S. population is either diabetic or pre-diabetic. We've got about 42% of the population is obese with it trending to 50% by 2030. 80% of the population consider, you know, cons- you know, considered overweight. You know, we got big issues with, you know, weight in our country. And look, I come by it honest. I mean, I've told a lot of folks over the years, if you've heard me talk, my brother was 476 pounds at one point. I got him down to 280. But, it, you know, I've been around obesity. My mother was obese. My father, a type 2 diabetic that was obese until he came to live with me. I uh, had a bunch of little Italians that are all uncles, nephews, and nieces that tend to seem to just kind of grow sideways instead of uh, getting taller. And so I've been around this a lot, developed weight loss programs for companies like Lifetime Fitness, you know, 250,000 lives implemented into. So been around this a lot. And you know what? When you're younger, just eating less and exercising a lot of times works. The older we get, the more we have other metabolic influences on on us, the harder it gets. And of course, you know, here are all the things that that fall into that category of flaming the fires of metaflammation leading to weight gain, oxidative stress, uh, imbalances in hormones, right? Estrogen dominance, low testosterone, stress hormones. We'll go through a little bit of this uh, through the course of this talk. Not a lot because we're going to focus on, you know, how do you use some glutide? How do you use trisepatide? How do you use other peptides that go with that? And then other key nutrients that you can do in conjunction with that. But glucose and insulin regulation, that's where it's at, guys. I mean, I can tell you right now, I mean, I wrote a book. Oh, gosh, this is probably 15 years ago now. It's called Diabetes and Cancer, Epidemiologic Links and Molecular Evidence. And what it went into was every last single step related to insulin resistance and what starts to happen as we uncouple our metabolism. That's where we'll be focusing a lot of our time tonight. And then obviously you got to look at the gut um, and gut microbiome. You know, I've been working with the gut now, oh my gosh, 40 years. And uh, you know, more and more we're finally seeing the validation of yes, a microbiome that's disturbed, that's less diverse. Uh, is going to have a big impact on inflammatory signaling in the body. And then, you know, immune balance, of course, because uh, as you'll see in a, in a following slide, as a section of the immune system or inflammatory cytokines start to dominate the architecture of your chemistry, you start to see changes in how your insulin receptor will function. And then, of course, there's areas like environmental burden. We could put medication in here, right? You get people on Seroquel, they gain 50 pounds in five months. It isn't because they ate 50 pounds worth of food and every last ounce of that weight came on because of the food. We know there are drugs that end up causing issues with metabolism and we have to deal with that. And then, of course, there's individuality. Now, and I don't like to hang that on people. I mean, I know for myself, I've got every gene working against me. I should be, I should have heart disease, should be diabetic already and should be obese. Got every gene for it. I got dealt the absolute worst hand you could be dealt. And uh, and you can control a lot of that, right? Through the choices that you make and what we learn and how we apply the knowledge that we learn at A4M and at the International Peptide Society. And that's really our job, right? Is we got to overcome the genetics and the decisions of that individual so that we can get them on the right path. But the right path is still not the magic bullet, right? For a lot of us that have been in this a while, you guys remember the HCG diet. People would do HCG. They do 500 to 800 calories. They get all the weight off. They're happy. They go back to eating the way they used to. They gain their weight back. And then they want to go back on HCG again. I'm worried that if we don't start to really emphasize the need for lifestyle and diet and, uh, and, and balancing chemistry in individuals, that we're just going to see the same thing happen with the GLP-1s, that people are going to use that as a crutch instead of an opportunity. Because I do believe they're a huge opportunity if we can work with them in a way that creates a more whole person metabolic health. So, you know, obviously, when you have metabolic disruption, the number one thing that's going to happen is it's going to affect insulin resistance. It's going to affect your neurochemistry. You're going to get craving issues, right? I mean, just face it. You get somebody that goes and gets, a, you know, a... Uh, you know, a gastric sleeve or they have gastric bypass, if they can't eat anymore, they'll turn to drinking or alcohol, right? Or they'll turn to cigarettes or they'll turn to gambling because of that hedonic urge, the neurochemistry gets changed. And therefore we need to work on that, right? How do we improve 
their dopamine receptors? How do we make things work better for them so those craving patterns go away? And obviously, as metabolism becomes errant, you know, the gaining of visceral fat, the gaining of belly fat, increasing those inflammatory adipokines that come from that excess fat, all of that ends up cascading down on the individual and accelerating their aging, right? So metaflammation leads to inflammation. Uh, and of course, these are all the things that can drive it, right? Drugs, toxins. I mean, a lot of studies on pesticides, altering thyroid hormone, um, arsenic, for example, inducing insulin resistance, um, you know, infection. Uh, if you've seen any Dr. Shoemaker's work or Dr. Heyman's work in terms of whole SIRS and mold toxicity, one of the key features of that is you know, that that person starts to move towards aerobic glycolysis or really uncoupling their ability to really generate energy efficiently. Obviously, there can be things like dental issues that trigger inflammation, not enough exercise, too much exercise, right? It's like, which way do you go now, right? It used to be we always worried about people just not exercising at all. Now I've got a population of people I got to worry about that are overdoing it and not getting the gains and the lean mass gains that they thought they should have gotten. Uh, and of course, dietary choices are huge and you can't blame people, right? I mean, do you go carnivore? Do you go paleo? Do you go pegan? Do you go low FODMAP, vegan, Mediterranean? Um, you know, it, you just don't, they just don't know. They're totally confused on what to eat, how to eat. And that can be a massive opportunity for us to help people. And then of course, stress and sleep is, a, is just a massive problem uh, that, that we have to address. This is what I was talking about. So when we start to talk about peptides and why peptides are valuable, it's because they really help us to countermeasure or counter against the role of chronic metabolic inflammation in individuals. So if you look at this particular chart, you know, met metabolic inflammation is there for a reason. If you get hurt, you get a damaged, you know, tissue or you get an irritant chemical that you get into you or a pathogen, you trigger inflammation. And that inflammation is there for a reason. It's there to neutralize that acute assault. Then the inflammation is turned off. And then you go back to what is known as homeostasis. Well, what's the problem with that? And this is what you're seeing. And I'm telling you right now, I believe probably 90% of the people that are coming into your practice they are stuck in a chronic inflammatory cycle for one reason or the other, right? Whether it's stress, diet, I'm not exercising because I'm working 14 hour days, uh, you know, any number of reasons, right? But in the end, they're triggering an inflammatory event that becomes chronic. And so if you look to the left, and they don't have this on the left, but you should write this down. When you see people that are high in apolipoprotein B, their LDL particle numbers 2000, their LPA is elevated, their LPPLA2 is elevated, uh, their myeloperoxidase is trending high, they're getting ready to start oxidizing their, their cholesterol, right? Uh, their fibrinogen may be high. Mean platelet volume, that's another one that you can look at to show that there's excess, you know, inflammatory effects going on if the mean platelet volume is in that fourth quartile or out of bounds. So the very first thing you think about lipids being off. Dyslipidemia tells you you've got an inflammatory event. Yeah, there's people that are genetically predisposed. I get that. But for a lot of people, their cholesterol problems happen because of they're eating wrong and they've got metabolic inflammation. You know, the, you know, they, they keep thinking that the chicken wings have enough hot sauce on them, that that hot sauce is acting as an antioxidant. Um, the next one is, of course, sarcopenia. So it turns out the more metabolically inflamed we get, the more cortisol we pump out, we, we unload on our growth hormone releasing hormone, we block it. And now, and you know, the big argument, should we have low growth hormone or high growth hormone? Turns out that both ends are bad. You want to have a healthy response to growth hormone, a normal response to growth hormone. When you fast for five days, your growth hormone goes down, your mTOR goes down. But on the sixth day, your growth hormone goes back up. Why? Because it's restoring tissues in a reparative process. So where peptides help right away can be in restoring anabolic drive and reducing sarcopenia, which of course is a major issue in the plus 55 population here in the U.S., 
And, and really, you see it even now in younger and younger people, right? The folks that are, they don't have to be obese. They don't have to be overweight. They could be skinny fat. They could have a high percentage of body fat. And that's because they're losing muscle mass and dynamic muscle perfusion. As people start to lose their microcapillary system, right? And, you know, we've heard about that through the loss of the glycocalyx. When the glycocalyx gets damaged, you lose your four, six, eight mic micron uh, capillaries. And then all of a sudden, we're not perfusing blood into our tissues, being able to create anabolic drive, get nutrients to the tissue, and get the waste products out. Next piece, anemias. How many people are you seeing like this? Normal irons, incredibly low ferritins. And that's because of the upregulation of epsidin, the downregulation of ferroportin, and now I'm not making ferritin from that process. And that is triggered by metabolic inflammation. So one of the big uh, things to keep in mind is that when you start to get this chronic metabolic inflammatory signaling, there's a lot of things that start to go wrong. When I don't have enough ferritin, more palpitations, more headaches, can't get up and down the steps as well. I'm out of breath a little bit easier. I'm not building new red blood cells as efficiently, right? It's a big problem. So anemias. The next it, of course, and what I think is central in focus, look, I'm all for the fact that, that you know, semaglutide and, and terzepatide and now these new uh, oral agents that will be coming out hopefully this fall are out there because people just aren't getting, you know, not getting any help on how to get weight off of them. I think the issue is they're also not getting really good counseling on how to maintain it and create a lifestyle that creates a normal weight for them. So what happens when you have increased, if you look within the insulin resistance box, TNF alpha goes up, the toll receptor four activation goes up, you start to, to get into your jack kinases that go up, and that turns down insulin receptor one and two activation, and in, 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 which means your glute four activation or glute four transport goes down. So you not only do you lose insulin signaling, you lose efficiency of insulin at the cell membrane, and now you start to get passive diffusion of glucose into the cell, which now creates more lactate, more pyruvate. Gee, my muscles are sore. I don't make a lot of energy. Yeah, doc, I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to stop eating bread. I'm going to stop eating rice. They're driving home. They're feeling tired. They stop at the bakery and get themselves a donut, or they stop at the liquor store because there are no broccoli shops. And even if there was... They're so inefficient at making energy that their brain is telling them they need to eat, right? So it's it's kind of that thing that you want to think about is that people want to try and do their best. It's just when your cells are starved because they can't make energy, they're like a gas-sucking SUV, it's hard for them. That's why I think this explosion occurred uh, around terzepatide and, and, and uh, the GLP-1 uh, agonist. The next one is bone loss. As your TNF alpha goes up, as interleukin 6 goes up, IL 1 beta goes up, I decrease my osteocalcin and increase osteoclast. Bone loss is not just a women's issue anymore, guys. So combine bone loss with loss of muscle. Now we're increasing our risk of falls, right? When we increase the risk of falls, we hit our head, we crack our hip. Both of those are tragic. Now, if we want to get really deep into the weeds on this, and I think this will play into just in a little bit when we start to talk about semaglutide's value on neuroprotection. As your in, in, inflammatory signaling is going up or you start to create neuroinflammation and that's going to cut down on the pruning of your dendritic fibers. You're going to decrease your BDNF1 alpha. So your growth factors for neurons goes down. You lose neurogenesis. You lose the plasticity of your cells. And now all of a sudden, yeah, my short-term memory's off. I'm pushing the thought through jello. I feel cognitively kind of cloudy. And then the last piece, which I think occurs much earlier than we appreciate, is we get mitochondrial dysfunction because as the inflammatory cytokines go up, we decrease cellular respiration in the synthesis of ATP. You go from making 30 plus packets of ATP when you bring glucose into the cell to now making two. That's what happens when you go to aerobic glycolysis. And when the NAD to NADH ratio goes down, look, we all learned about that through the pandemic, right? Low NAD to NADH, you get sick, you crash your NAD to NADH ratio, that triggers even more 
cytokine storm, and then your PGC1 alpha gets downregulated, which of course is the co-activator for mitochondrial biogenesis, the co-activator for thyroid hormones, the co uh, the, at the receptor site, many of your sex hormones, your neurochemical receptor sites, codependent on PGC1 alpha. So, you know, when you think about this, you know, diabetes, I mean, like I said, guys, I've been around diabetes so much over 40 years, you know, professionally lecturing about it, developing programs on it on a national basis. We're developing a new one right now. It's going to be going into a major grocery chain. Um, This inflammation ends up putting more fat in your muscles. So if you're looking at the new cool scans that are out there, like the OMA scan, where it shows the marbling of your muscle. So yeah, people that have diabetes, that's grade prime, right? More marbling, more fat. You can you can tell the metabolic dysregulation by how much fat is marbled into the muscle. You have you know less storage of glycogen. You affect the, the microbiome. Just look at people that are diabetic or insulin resistant. How many times do they have fungus growing on their skin or growing on their nails? And you know, I always tell people, look, fungus on the outside. You know, fungus on the inside, you're probably growing some candida. You look at their tongue, it's coated, it's white. They've got, you know, dysbiosis. And then, of course, they're getting more uh, fat storage, right? And that fat storage means you're going to create more adipokines. You make more resistin, uh, which leads to, you know, enlarged heart, right? Left ventricle heart failure with resistin. You get more angiotensinogen that gets produced. So you're converting angiotensin one to two, creating, you know, hypertension. Uh, and of course, you get B cell failure. So why is it so important then that we think of these, you know, these issues? Well, you know, when you look at this, 43% of the U.S. population BMI greater than 30, and overweight per- people, when they lose weight, 20 to 30% of their total weight loss is lean muscle mass. Now they're going to probably carve some lean muscle mass down. You have somebody 300 pounds, they're going to lose some lean muscle mass. But ideally, what you're doing is you're leading the, you know, a metabolism to burning the majority of fat. So, you know, obviously, when we're lowering muscle, we lower our resting energy expenditure. You lower your neuromuscular ability. You know, that that's going to be for sure. You're going to become more fatigued. You know, your day to day performance is going down. And of course, you have an increased risk of injury because of that loss of muscle mass as well. And then, of course, the key thing we're talking about tonight is how do you keep that lean muscle mass? Oh, did I miss one? Yes. So here's the big things that, that I want you to think about. You always want to think about correcting the cortisol, glucose, thyroid, and insulin relationship, right? Cortisol goes up, insulin goes up, blood sugar goes up, thyroid goes down. If cortisol is up long enough and your gut gets leaky, start to attack your thyroid, right? So you see this all the time with Hashimoto's and a high stressed person, they've gained weight, their glucose is at 98, their fasting insulin may be at 15, you know, it's not out of bounds, but it's really higher than it should be. And then of course, getting them to exercise. Look, I just get people trying to walk. If I can get them to walk, ideally get them to walk at least 30 minutes, five to six days a week. Yeah, if they can go to another way of training, fine. But my goal would be to get them to walk 45, 50 minutes, six days a week. Um, do something, right? Um, they can do some weights, whatever it is that they like to do. Just get people moving. They got to stop getting in their car to go to the end of the driveway and get their mail out of their mailbox, right? Got to get people moving. Uh, and all everything being delivered to our home isn't helping. Because you used to be able to at least, when you had to walk into the store, you get to walk into the store. Now you got Amazon drivers bringing your stuff to you. Um, sex hormone balance, incredibly important. Uh, gut immune brain, gut immune brain interactions in the enteric nervous system, right? So it's that connection between the gut and the brain and the immune signaling that goes on with it. And then of course, you know, you may, if you want to think about more advanced things for weight loss, you think of vectors, molds, viruses, you know, metals, pesticides. And, you know, as we go through this, why is cortisol so important? I would encourage everybody, get going on getting people measured for a circadian cortisol. Whether you use urine or saliva, find out if they flatten their cortisol. Do they have an inverted cortisol pattern? We know enough just by morning cortisols. If your morning cortisol is low, you're 
going to have more than likely have poorer performance as you age. And you'll perform um, you know, worse even on a physical test, like a treadmill walking test, balance as well as speed. So yeah, if all you're going to do is get a morning cortisol, great. That'll give you some inclination. But finding out if they flatten their cortisol curve is incredibly important because of the flattening of the cortisol curve is absolutely related to metabolic syndrome, neurodegenerative disorders, mood disorders. So why not measure cortisol? Uh, because it is absolutely one of the key things related to muscle wasting. And we measure this all the time for athletes, their cortisol and testosterone. So that, you know, if your cortisol is high and your test is low, you're catabolic. And if, of course, when cortisol is high and your DHEA pool is low, you start losing memory. There's a whole bunch of reasons why cortisol is an issue, right? You get elevated, lip, elevated lipids, typically bad actor lipids as your cortisol goes up. Um, you lose deep sleep, you lose REM sleep, you're more prone to plaque formation. And of course, with muscle, muscle atrophy, basically, as glucocorticoid activity goes up, we start to block the influence of IGF-1. And once again, this isn't about is IGF-1 good or bad. It is the cyclic timing of IGF-1. Do you do want to do periods of fasting when you're downregulating mTOR? and increase decreasing nutrient sensing so you can induce autophagy? Absolutely. Absolutely, we need to do autophagy. But we also need to do cell renewal. So it's two sides to the story. The IGF-1 is there for a reason. Insulin is there for a reason. Cortisol is there for a reason. When we get too much of any of them, it starts to become a problem. So when, when we end up with poor regulation of IGF-1, we end up in this mus muscle atrophy effect. And of course, if you look at cortisol and sex hormones, uh, you know, you, you, you can see here that, you know, cortisol blocks T4 to T3. Then you get thyroid hormone receptor upregulating to create more T4 because T3 is down. And then as you're increasing that thyroid hormone receptor, uh, hormone that increases the prolactin, which downregulates LH and FSH, which downregulates testosterone, as well as growth hormone. So you you know these things are all interrelated, right? Um, this is one that I think we're seeing more and more people with elevated prolactins, right? Uh, sleep and skeletal muscle, obvious. You know you're not releasing growth hormone, you're not inducing any anabolic drive, you're not getting a rest phase to your body. That that creates you know. Once again, it's going to create um, muscle loss. And then, of course, this is just that whole sleep, testosterone, and cortisol balance. Uh, as, your, as your cortisol goes up and you are decreasing gonadotropin-releasing hormone and you're decreasing testicular steroidogenesis, you're decreasing testosterone, you're creating a more catabolic drive. As your cortisol is going up, uh, you're, you're also blocking... Um, growth hormone releasing hormone. So you block that as well. But in the end, you lose bone, you lose muscle, you become insulin resistant, and your cognition and mood change. How many people were in those three buckets right there that you see in your practice? It's all day long, right? I've gained weight, my blood sugars are up. Gosh, my bone, you know, I'm osteopanic, I'm losing muscle strength, my grip strength is less, which is a key indicator of aging, right? Is grip strength. Uh, and then my mood's flat, you know, and I'm, I'm feeling like I'm pushing a thought through jello. My short term memory isn't good. And then, of course, as you have type 2 diabetes, you know, it, basically the net of this slide is, is that as you're increasing NF kappa B, you have a much higher expression of muscle atrophy through the, the atrophy transcription factor, FOXO1. So people with diabetes signal more muscular atrophy. It's why it's even more important for them to exercise and to get their blood sugars under control and to decrease their pro-inflammatory signaling. Super important. And, you know, look at their MPV. Where's their CRP? Where's their homocysteine at? You know, where, you know, where, you know, where is their, you know, lipidemia markers, right? Do they have a lot of dyslipidemia that's going on? Where's their glucose and insulin? right? Where's their cortisol at? All of these things add up. 
they they kind of chain together like a chain of pearls that lead to obesity and muscle loss. And adiponectin, if you're not measuring adiponectin, you should be measuring adiponectin. Adiponectin is the compound that in, it, that goes down as PGC1 alpha goes down. So it gets suppressed. And so it, when you have less adiponectin, your mitochondrial content is less within your cell. You increase fat mass and you decrease blood sugar control. Adiponectin is needed for signaling of good uh, insulin receptor function. So you can measure adiponectin. Give you just a blanket, what is bad? Even though it depends on which lab you use. Some some labs like LabCorp has it at age as to what's normal. I'm going to just tell you, 10 or less is bad. You want to have an adiponectin in the teens and that's a good, just broad stroke thought on, on what to do with adiponectin. And adiponectin is inversely related to leptin. You know, your adiponectin is in a, in a good state. You don't get leptin resistance. All right. So adiponectin, you can measure. You can measure it through through Quest. You can measure it through LabCorp. It's not a specialty lab. But everybody should be measuring this on people. And basically, this is what, you know, adiponectin's role is. If you look, it's when you increase adiponectin, you're, you know, burning fat, improving GLUT4 metabolism, you're improving your fatty acid utilization, and you're improving glucose transport. It's basically what this is, you know, saying. And PGC1-alpha, why is it so important? Because it literally is a regulator of thermogenesis. So, you know, do you want brown fat? Do you want white fat, right? Do you, you know, it's a co-activator for neurotransmitters and hormones. So the peroxisome proliferating um, activated receptor or the PPAR coactivator, PGC1-alpha, I've been talking about this now for probably 12 years. Um, when that is low, you get more oxidative stress, you lose fatty acid metabolism, you don't regulate glucose as well, and you're in your biogenesis for mitochondria, you don't get mitochondrial renewal. You know, that's why everybody talked about resveratrol and resveratrol was the hot t- topic. It's because it was a PGC1 alpha activator. It, it it helped in the production of PGC1 alpha. Green tea does. They made a list of the ones of things that are good for PGC1 alpha. So if you look at arginine, it does that through AMPK. Uh, also, if you're doing, you know, at least 1212 or 1410, in order to get to autophagy, I'm not a big fan of 16-8 every day. I see too many people with elevated cortisols and their their lipids look wonky. So I'm not a big 16-8 person, but you know, it, it's kind of funny. When I was a kid, you know, 12-12 was the way you did it. You ate, ate at breakfast at seven, lunch at noon, at dinner at five. And if you're a good little boy, you got a snack at seven. Oh my God, we were doing 12-12 fasting when I was a kid. Maybe that's why I stayed skinny. I don't know. Right. But here are all the things that that you reach for or have heard about. Right. Alpha lipoic acid increases insulin receptor sensitivity. One of the mechanisms is because through activating AMPK, it upregulates PGC1 alpha, which makes the insulin receptor fire. Same thing with thyroid receptors. Actually, it helps the efficiency of thyroid receptors. That's why when you give alpha lipoic acid many times, you'll see T3 levels go up. and you don't need to give as much thyroid hormone. Um, quercetin, dihydrocorsetin, fisetin, of course, kind of the new darling, you know, compound for people on the anti-aging world or the, the biohackers. They've found out that fisetin helps PGC1 alpha. Um, whoop, sorry, let me go back. And so once again, where are we at? Why? Because we're going to get into the GLP ones now. Why are we doing this? We're trying to spare GLUT4 transport. This is the normal transport of glucose across your cell that makes 38 packets of energy uh, and keeps us at a low lactic acid level, no intracellular acidity. Like what happens is people become insulin resistant to diabetic and diabetic to people with cancer is that they could keep uncoupling their ability to make energy within their cell. Um, which is important. Uh, And once again, you would get enough chromium in your cell. You get chromium transporter protein that goes to the insulin receptor, turns it on, the insulin receptor opens up, catches the insulin and opens up the glute glute 4 transport. 
So that's why chromium is important. People, oh, I stopped taking chromium. I stopped losing weight. Well, yeah, because all the weight you lost was chromium dependent. Doesn't mean you stop taking it. Maybe you take a little less for maintenance, but you don't stop taking it. And why this is an issue. When you move to GLUT1, you get more actually damage accumulation to your DNA. So you, what happens is that your, your, your mitochondrial content gets damaged by all the lactic acid. So you start to create oncogens that start to try to protect it in, in a highly acidotic environment. And so it starts to create its own glutathione in order to protect itself. That's that whole protection for that for that uh, polyribose ADP. And then more glucose goes through the cell. You get more lactate. That creates uh, less uh, reduced pH. And then you get more hydrogen ions pumped into the intra intracellular space, creating a necrotic space for what? For that immortal cell to start to grow. So what we're going to talk about now is just, you know, how are we going to correct for lean mass? How are we going to get people to lose weight, given everybody's on board now with using, you know, trisepatide, using semaglutide, at least a lot of people are. I mean, and yes, there are going to be some people that don't tolerate it. And what are some other options that you can do there? Um, whether you want to use tesofensin or you want to use 5-amino-1-MQ or, or you, know, you know, other compounds that could help, like AOD-9604. Um, other compounds that could help get to that next level of weight loss. So we can use dietary supplements to help peptides. You need to exercise. Yes, people need to learn how to eat better. They just can't live on Cheetos and just eat less of them. Uh, they got to get sleep and stress uh, hygiene together. You know, I, I teach people how to box breathe. Hey, just do box breathing three minutes twice a day. Get that stress down. Um, watch your smartwatch right? How is your sleep? What's your REM sleep? What's your deep sleep? What's it like when you drink? What's it like when you eat late? It's amazing what that has done. I mean, I got to tell you, for me anyway, it's amazing. I finally have learned, I mean, 12 times a day I can breathe now because it tells me to breathe. I'm super excited. But you got to think about that. We actually have devices now telling us that we're not breathing deep. Well, why aren't we breathing deep? Because we're in sympathetic dominance, which is going to lead to metabolic inflammation, which leads to insulin resistance and a lot of adrenaline release, which leads reduced blood vessel volume. Now my heart's pushing harder through those kidneys. Start up with hypertension. So GLP-1 agonists, you know, obviously they're in Cretan mimetics. They uh, secreted by the small intestine in response to food. It enhances insulin secretion from the beta cells. Uh, and decreases glucagon release from the pancreatic uh, alpha cells. And then it also increases the resistance to enzyme degradation by DPP4. So that means it's going to work longer. Why is this being used? Well, it turns out, you know, it actually helps in terms of heart disease. Uh, I'll show you some studies on, on it helping with neuroinflammation. And uh, look, the main reason it's being used right now by millions of Americans is the fact that we got 50% of our population are insulin resistant or diabetic and approaching 50% of are obese and 80% of people that are overweight. That in spite of everything else you tried on them, I want you to diet. I want you to exercise. I want you to exercise more. I want you to diet more. Nothing was coming off. And people would come in and tell you this and you'd be like, yeah, nah, maybe they're lying. And they're saying, I'm telling you, I did exactly what you said. It's because sometimes the threshold to get this glucose and insulin regulation under control, it's too high of a wall to scale. And that's why even with alpha lipoic acid, even with chromium, even with intermittent fasting, yes, some people, it works fantastic when it does. But for a lot of people, it doesn't. And I think this is a, you know, why this is so important is GLP-1 agonists help people to get their appetite down. Yes, does semaglutide cause some gastric distress? Of course, it can. So you titrate the dose slowly, and yeah, they're not going to lose weight quite as quick. So what? You know, you can get, and then we'll talk about other strategies to help that. But, you know, when you look at the GLP-1 agonists, of course, it increases cardiac output. It, it helps with cardioprotection. If you look to the left, decreases appetite increases neuroprotection and decreases stroke risk. Decreasing appetite, guys, think about it. How many of you have a urge? 
you get home at the end of the day and you look at the tortilla chip bag or the potato chip bag or the cookie jar for your kids and you go over and you eat one and you stop. Probably not, right? Most likely it's like, oh, I'll just have two. And then two hits and you go, hey, you know what? I don't like even numbers. I'm going to have three. Before you know it, if you're in the potato chip bag, you're licking your finger, getting the salt out of the bottom of the bag, right? Clear sign of hedonic eating. And what I like about GL Pan 1 agonists, it's an easy way to help them to calm their brain down and get them to eat less. Do I think this is a miracle? No, you, you still need to work with how do we use them? Are there side effects? Some people get anxious from them every once in a while. I've heard that. Um, some people don't tolerate it. I just, hey, you know what? My gut just doesn't feel right or I'm getting diarrhea. Uh, no matter what dose you have me at, all right, fine. We can't use them. Let's look to something else. What else can we do, right? So the cardiovascular effects are you know, really fantastic, right? Especially for people with metabolic syndrome or in the case of like, you know, family members I had, you know, all of them diabetic, overweight, they got heart issues, they've got plaque, they've got all kinds of issues that are going on. And and then having that ability to kind of, you know, suspend vascular smooth muscle proliferation right? Get, and then be able to use things like maybe aged garlic extract or endocalyx, something to get those blood vessels to dilate again, right? The power of using nutrients with GLP-1 is staggering. You know, improving endothelial function, maybe you want to use a beet extract. I mean, you got, if you probably have heard Nathan Bryant talk, world-renowned expert on nitric oxide, it's incredibly important to do that. Or if you've got people that are overweight, or they're pre-diabetic and they're on, uh, they're using any of the, you know, the uh, agents for erectile dysfunction. So they're using sildenafil or tadalafil, you know, any, uh, any of the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, that depletes nitric oxide, right? So instead of just giving people more drugs to fix drugs, think of what's being depleted so that I can replace that so that the drug continues to work, but I'm not going to increase my risk of a side effect, Right. Um, of course, an infarct and injury size, lowering intracellular calcium overload, you know, glucose induced, uh, you know, apoptosis. I mean, and then of course, having a general anti-inflammatory effect. This was the, the, the side that I thought was fascinating because we all understand, you know, it was just that because there's a major dementia walk in Ohio. And I was back at Ohio speaking to a big grocery train and, you know, they're doing this walk and everybody's talking about it. Yeah. Dementia type three diabetes, right? If you've got somebody that goes on a ketogenic diet and they tell you, man, did that clear my head? I'm thinking so clear on a ketogenic diet. That's telling you how damaged their insulin receptors are. Your brain's supposed to use glucose. It's okay to use some fats. It's okay to use ketones, but I can tell you right now, at least for me, and I've, you know, I've been doing this 40 years and I've probably, you know, at points of time seeing 300 people a week, you know, people that stay on ketogenic diets for a long time start to lose, it starts to lose its luster after a while and people can't sustain it. So why not fix the glucose receptors and go fix that insulin receptor, utilize glucose better. So, you know, the GLP-1, it actually is reducing lipopolysaccharide damage to the microglial cells. So you make lipopolysaccharide because we reduce circulation, Right. Reduce circulation, kills off microbiome. Microbiome releases lipopolysaccharide or circulating endotoxin. Lipopolysaccharide crosses the blood-brain barrier, triggers microglial cell activation. So what we know about GLP-1s is that it it inhibits lipopolysaccharide-induced inflammatory signaling to the microglia. It suppresses TNF-alpha-associated cytokine and chemokine release in the microglia. It improves mitochondrial function and survival. It improves neural structure as well. So neurite length, number of neurites from the soma, and the secondary branching or the dendritic branching increases with GLP-1s and improves synaptic plasticity. So if you look here, uh, obviously we see a neuron here, simplified neuron structure. See, not a lot of branching here. With GLP-1s, we get more dendritic branching and inactivated microglia versus activated. I spent a lot of time learning how to do this, whether it's using things like synapsin or 
using other agents like RB1 or you know, CMAX, Cellank, you name it, this is a major target for neuroinflammation. And of course, it helps with regulation of memory. It activates autophagy. And, you know, so when you combine a good diet, like really good diet strategy with GLP-1s, and you combine kind of picking up their nutrient reservoir, things like magnesium, omega-3 fatty acids, um, all of a sudden, and you know, dampening their cortisol response if they're stressed out, so they're not losing DHEA and they're not damaging their hippocampus. All of a sudden, you are really in a rejuvenation mode with someone. So brain-derived GLP-1 also reported to improve glucose metabolism and insulin resistance in the brain. Obviously, they're looking at potential uses for, you know, Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. Obviously, even the PDE-5s, right? If you look at the, the research on sildenafil, tadalafil on uh, dementia reduction, huge, right? Why though? Because it's improving circulation. Why is the circulation a problem to begin with? Because for a lot of people, if they're insulin resistant, those blood vessels get small, lots of adrenaline, and you're losing nitric oxide. So on muscle loss, so here is the thing. Everybody, you know, I, I love this talk. Oh, I scanned four people and all of them lost all muscle and had nothing, no fat was lost, only muscle. The studies in humans would show that GL1 receptor agonists ameliorate muscle wasting. I'm going to tell you that I don't think GLP-1 agonists do anything better than when you put people on a low-calorie diet. I think in general, you're more than likely going to see 20 to 30% muscle loss if you do not do things to support their muscle recovery. All right? So muscle atrophy, it happens in people with diabetes, it happens in people that are trying to lose weight, and it happens in people that are insulin resistant and overweight. And so they suppress what's called the MSTN and muscle at at atrophic factors, and that ends up enhancing. So you have an opportunity to improve muscle with GLP-1s, but maybe creatine or HMB use ipamorelin and CJC with it, um, get people to exercise. That can really have a big impact on this kind of, or what I call urban myth. I'm losing all muscle and no fat, but the studies don't support that. In the step one study, semaglutide primary clinical trial, 140 patients went under DEXA scan for body composition. Participants on semaglutide lost an average of 10% of their fat mass, 6.9% of their lean mass, Placebo lost an average of 1.2 of fat mass and 1.5 of lean body. If you look at that, you're, you know, you know, you're at about 30%, 16 on six, right? That's about 30%. That's if all people are going to do is take it, I would say count on losing 20 to 30% of your lean mass. But it's no more than if you just put them on a low-calorie diet. You know, you're putting them on a 1,200 calorie diet or 1,500 calorie diet or 1,800 calorie diet if you're a man. Maybe it's a low modified low-carb, low-allergen, anti-inflammatory diet. If they're not exercising, you're not stimulating muscle synthesis, they're going to lose it. Total lean mass decreased in absolute terms of kilograms. The proportion of lean body mass relative to total body mass increased. New England Journal of Medicine, um, you know, like I know, I realize it. Sometimes our journals don't always report things, but multiple journals have shown this. So no, semaglutide doesn't make you lose more lean mass than just regular diet alone. This is the STAIN-8 3B clinical trial, 178 patients, body composition tested on DEXA, one milligram, which I hardly ever use a milligram of semaglutide. I'm usually around 500 mics or less because I'm, I'm getting people to eat better, getting them to exercise and fixing their hormones and helping them with other peptides or other nutrients. Um, total lean mass loss, 2.3 kilogram and 1.5 kilogram with the semaglutide and the canafliglazone, uh, respectively. The proportional lean mass increased by 1.2 to 1.1%. 1. Uh, changes in visceral fat mass and overall changes in body composition assessed in the fat to lean mass ratio comparable between the two treatment groups. You use either one if you want, you know, use liraglutide orally if you want, right? Not as effective, but you could do it. Once again, what are the side effects? Not to be used in pregnancy, should be continued at least two months before planning on pregnancy. Side effects, GI symptoms, nausea, headache, uh, constipation, diarrhea, 
You can get some injection site redness. Where are the severe side effects? Of course, um, allergic reactions, people with a history or family history of thyroid C-cell carcinomas probably shouldn't be doing this. Uh, and then, of course, pancreatitis, check their amylase, check their lipase before you get them started. Uh, kidney injury, but that was uh, due to nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. So hopefully you're going to warn of people for that. Uh, and then if you titrate the dose slow, I have to tell you, I've had one person uh, that has had diarrhea that we couldn't correct. Um, that's because it, it just didn't work for him. Uh, it was on terzepatide. We put him back on semaglutide. He did fine. So sometimes it's just one or the other. You might want to try it. You may want to try that. I had one person that was taking it every day, not from us. They, we just, I just got a call to manage somebody that was in a hot, you know, they're in the hospital. They've got, you know, they're, you know, uncontrolled vomiting. Why are you taking it every day? Another person that had gallbladder pain. This is about a month and a half ago. They somehow got the idea that they could take it three times a week. Follow the directions. You may see enhanced weight loss by doing it twice a week, but that's not what the literature says to do. So once again, I already went through these. So, you know, we're not going to go through them again. So what's the uh, indication on semaglutide, adjunct to diet and exercise, improved glycemic control in adults with type 2 diabetes? Approved for weight loss maintenance, not necessarily for type 1 diabetes, although you're seeing some papers come out on that now. 2021 study, obviously, this is 2.4 milligrams, which is a big dose. This is obviously an obese, overweight, uh, randomized trial, 803 individuals, 20-week trial, mean weight loss, 10.6%. Uh, so if you look here, randomized and continued treatment of, of uh, semaglutide versus placebo, another 48 weeks. At 48 weeks, another 7.9% on the semaglutide versus placebo, they added weight back. If you don't change the lifestyle, you don't change the, the, the inputs, stress, sleep, movement, they get off of it. The weight's going to come back. It, you know, it, it's, it just is going to, it's going to happen. I mean, uh, semaglutide versus liraglutide. Look, the end point of this is that basically you lost more weight with semaglutide, uh, you know, in a double blind placebo controlled uh, trial. Uh, so, okay. Uh, that's fine. I want to kind of get to the peptides that you can use. So I, I don't want to, uh, so results here on semaglutide. Once again, if you look, um, you know, at, uh, you know, 0.5 milligrams minus 6%, 0.1 milligram, negative eight, six at 0.2 milligrams, 11%. Um, and then 0.3, 13 and 0.4, that was a 13, eight. So yeah, you go up, I go, like I said, I go, I usually end up, we end up at about 500 micrograms in the clinics that I'm involved with. So, you know, so obviously you try to get that minimum of, of uh, 200 mics. And uh, I think we'll go past here. And this is just oral semaglutide versus, you know, diet and exercise alone. Obviously, you get more weight change when you add semaglutide. The, the higher the dose orally, the better. Advantages of this, I don't have to stick myself. Disadvantage, I got to take it daily. And you're going to start people with three, move them to seven and get them to 14 anyway. Uh, oral semaglutide uh, versus placebo and insulin treated uh, type 2 diabetics. Once again, if you look at their weight change, uh, you know, the oral semaglutide helped, right? Terzepatide, uh, you know, obviously now a dual agonist, right? You, you know, a, a GIP, GLP-1. So, you know, it's I, I really like terzepatide more if people can afford it because they don't seem to have the same side effects. Uh, certainly, it helps to reduce hemoglobin A1C. And once again, uses an adjunct to diet and exercise. Adjunct to diet and exercise. Uh, established in five major trials as a monotherapy. And then also you can layer things in it like metformin or the sulfonylureas. This is a 2022 study. Three double-blind randomized continuous control trials with 2,539 adults. If you look at this, 5, 10, or 15 milligrams over 72 weeks, and then a 20-week dose escalation period. Just ramp the dose up slowly so they get used to it. You may be able to get, keep them at 7.5 milligrams versus thinking they got to go all the way to 15. Use the minimum amount to gain the maximum weight loss. And by the way, Watch how fast they're losing weight because remember, there's this little thing called getting gallstones or kidney stones, right? So that's why I like to ramp it up slow, get them losing consistent weight, get them into a pattern 
of lifestyle change that gets them to their goal. So if you look at the statistics on this, if you go down to the bottom here, 15% weight loss at five milligrams and 80, 85%, 19.5%. Uh, in 10 milligrams on 89% of the participants, 20.9% at 15 milligrams and 91%. So this absolutely, you know, I have found it to be fantastic. It works really great. But once again, I'm big on that escalation every three or four weeks. Um, some cases on the first phase of the escalation at the smallest dose, I'll go two weeks and then go to every four weeks. Um, same thing, adverse events, similar to semaglutide, nausea, vomiting, constipation, diarrhea. Um, I, I know I see this at the, the side effect profiles, but because I escalate slowly, I just don't have many people where we have side effects from it. Um, and, you know, other conclusion is that obviously it's effective for weight loss and it's going to help to reduce cardiovascular risk factors, blood pressure and cholesterol. Um, dosing, you know, half-life is about half you know, about a little more than five days. It's once a week dosing. I hear people, I'm doing it twice a week. I'm layering it. Remember the kinetics of that layer, 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 layer. You want to try and, you know, follow the instructions. Uh, make sure that, you know, hey, once a week, we can increase that dose. But what else are you doing to help yourself with that weight loss? Uh, once again, same box warning. You've got a black box warning on terzepatide uh, regarding thyroid C cell tumors. I've got the actual um, black box warning here. So this is, you know, you know could cause C cell tumors and it's caused it in rats. Uh, so it's contraindicated patients with a personal or family history of mentally thyroid uh, cancers or with multiple endocrine neoplasia syndrome type 2. Uh, so just keep that in mind. That's what the black box warning is. Um, not to be used in pregnancy. Um, and then, of course, you know, switch to a non-oral contraceptive or add barrier method of contraception for four weeks after initiation of tricepatide. Uh, continue four weeks post-dose ex escalation. Uh, and it, once again, these are just more of the kind of the warnings. What, are, what else could you use to go with? What other peptides could you use to go with it? Well, one of the big ones is MOT-C, mitochondrial-derived protein or mitochondrial-derived peptide. It's 16 amino acids in length, and it preserves mitochondrial function. So we use this a lot in COVID long haulers. We use it in a lot of people with chronic fatigue because MOTC helps to activate mitochondria and get them making energy again. What's your target role? Metabolic inflammation, uh, signaling issues like glucose and insulin regulation because tired out, tuckered out mitochondria mean that your insulin receptors aren't going to fire appropriately. And obviously, as we age, we lose mitochondrial capacity. So it has kind of a longevity or anti-aging benefit. Uh, so as we age, our MOTC um, goes down. And what does it do? It helps with nuclear gene regulation, helps with skeletal muscle metabolism. So tissue anabolism. And helps a bunch. I mean, I have a lot of people I give MOTC to just to help with their glucose regulation. Uh, it also helps with uh, chronic kidney disease uh, in terms of, um, you know, improving GFR. Probably not the first thing I would do. Probably would work more at using like that Endocalyx Pro is really good, using Shadavari, um, you know, a couple different herbs like that work really well. Uh, and so, MOTC, typically the dose five to 10 milligrams twice a week. So it raises NAD levels. It uh, helps improve insulin sensitivity and it helps with PGC1 alpha upregulation. So I really like MOTC as a secondary agent to improving that insulin receptor sensitivity and kickstarting the mitochondria and insulin resistant people who've had really crappy mitochondrial output, right? They're making two packets of, glu of, of uh, ATP with their glucose intake. So, you know, here are all the different things that it does, upregulating brown adipose tissue, uh, upregulates thermogenic gene expression. It helps to increase glucose uptake into the muscles. So we get better glycogen storage. We upregulate AMPK, which is going to help with PGC1 alpha. It helps with, uh, you know, improving glucose utilization and fat oxidation. And this is kind of the, you know, bottom line on MOTC, aging and stress downregulates MOTC, we upregulate MOTC, and we're improving phyto, you know, fatty acid oxidation and mitochondrial metabolism. So 
Hence, it's you some weight loss. If I was going to think of one thing, though, and here's the dose, five five to 10 milligrams twice a week. Um, yeah, you may want to give some folate with it because it, you know, sometimes it can deplete folate. So I think that's a good call. If you see your homocysteine going up, man, when you're taking MOTC, you're, you know, you may be an MTHFR gene SNP person. Maybe give, you give some methylfolate with it. Uh, and then obviously looking at homocysteine as a marker for that. But here is what you use for people. Like I always do this on folks as long as they don't have a history of cancer. And, you know, and I'd even say for, you know, Ipamor- or for the, the um, GLP-1 agonists, if people have had various intestinal surgeries and you're worried about, you know, strictures or those kind of things, you're probably going to move over to using something like Ipamorelin and CJC, maybe, um, you know, 5-amino-1-MQ, which is a peptide, which also helps with mitochondrial vigilance. But ipamorelin and CJC is anabolic. It promotes anabolic pathways in skeletal muscles. It regulates them. It increases muscle protein synthesis. And you also get ghrelin activity from this that helps to negate the nausea feeling from semigluta. So synergistic effects on growth hormone, meaning you're going to normalize growth hormone release. So it improves the number of pulses and the height of the pulse. Uh, and also helps with, you know, improving lean mass has minimal effect on prolactin, you know, so it also helps. I love people taking this. They're going to do one dose a day, do it at bedtime because it, it, it depletes their, it helps to increase REM sleep and de- slow wave sleep. And that's independent of age. So just doing that right before you go to bed is going to be a great way to help with recovery of sleep getting circadian rhythm back for the brain, helping to retrieve the master-slave clock or the super, super chiasmatic nucleus, um, you know, helps with muscle growth and memory retention, helps the HPA axis and regulates cortisol release. That's why I like this so much as a, as a peptide. CJC-1295 is going crazy out there in the market. People are talking about it like nuts, but using the ipamorelin with it really gives it the growth hormone and ghrelin receptor kind of the double barrel punch of getting that growth hormone to release. So when you use it together, you get fat loss and maintenance of lean muscle. So use this with that. And that, and once again, helps with sleep. Similar cost to sermorelin. If you like sermorelin, fine, you can use it instead. You get better GH secretion from using ipamorelin and CJC. This is just a diagram showing of, you know, how ipamorelin works on the uh, ghrelin receptor and then the growth hormone re- releasing hormone receptor uh, with CJC-1295 or something like tesamorelin, which of course is no longer really available to any amount. Uh, I gave you dosing, basically 100 micrograms at bedtime, five out of seven nights a week. You can also do it in the morning if you want to increase fat loss, if somebody doesn't mind getting poked twice a day, morning and night. Just don't eat a half hour after and try to make it a high protein meal and try not to eat like an hour before bedtime or even two hours before bed, which you should be doing anyway. And I just kind of gave you these and I'll be glad to share these slides if anybody wants them, be more than happy to send them to Amy so that she can uh, she could disperse them as needed. Uh, so just dosing right here, it goes over the food and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, other one is PEG MGF, mechanical growth factor. So this is um, skeletal muscle stretch overload results in an increase in IGF-1. That IGF-1 causes an increase in mechanical growth factor, which helps MNRA transcription for protein synthesis. You can do this 10 days on, 10 days off, but mechanical growth factor helps to maintain lean mass. So say you're your first three or four weeks into your, your semiglutide or your terzepatide, you're doing your titration, dose escalation. Now they're starting to really lose weight. So you see the weight going down, but maybe they're not training as much as they can. You don't have them on IG, on, on ipamorelin or CJC. You could add this to help maintain some of that lean mass. So I, this is something I think is way underutilized in the peptide world. And once again, this is just kind of, you know, um, repair of uh, damage muscle in humans. I'd say BPC-157 with this, if we're going to do that, if we're talking about pre-exercise, post-exercise. This is both kind of showing, you know, repair by using uh, mechanical growth factor versus not. And once again, um, helps with heart. 
So if you see here with the MGF expression induced one hour after an event remains elevated for up to eight weeks. Why? Because your body's trying to repair your heart after a, you know, ischemic event. So it helps with proliferation and migration of mesenchymal bone marrow derived stem cells. That's great. Maybe do this before you do a stem cell procedure, right? Uh, so something to think about if, you, um, you know, unrelated to weight loss, you know, once again, improves cardiac function, helps with left ventricular ejection fraction, something a lot of people with insulin resistance or diabetes have, right? To get left ventricle enlargement. So something to think about if you're going to get them losing weight, maybe they got a little bit of that going on. Think about PEG MGF. And also helps in terms of repair neurons in the brain. Uh, you know, so once again, think of uh, PEG MGF as a way for brain repair, muscle repair, heart being muscle, and bone repair in stimulating stem cells. So decreasing NMDA excitotoxicity, incredibly interesting, right? In terms of what goes on with damaging the brain. And then of course it goes down with aging, with the loss of muscle mass, you lose less MGF transcription. That's why it's interesting. Uh, when you give MGF, you get an improvement in muscle cross-sectional area in elderly patients. Wow. So MGF administration may ameliorate sarcopenia. Interesting. That's annals in New York Academy of Sciences. I mean, the, you know, the references on this aren't, you know, from any small literature base, right? These are tier one primary referee journals. So I'm a big fan of this because, of course, if you're old and trying to lose weight, now you got two things working against you, right? Because you should be increasing your protein when you're over the age of 60 for sure. That's shown related to longevity and then try to push people out of sarcopenia by decreasing their inflammation, maybe using something like PEG MGF. And uh, dose three, you know, dose three to four times a week. Typically you'll use, you know, 10 units, you know, of, of uh, PEG MGF. Uh, but you can do it three to four times a week. You can do it two weeks on, a week off. I mean, there's no, hey, you have to do it this way. But even doing it three to four times a week is actually adequate. And, uh, you know, the PEG just increases, you know, muscle stem, uh, you know, count so that you get, you know, more mature muscle cells. So it's the pegylation of the MGF, which basically extends its, its activity in the body. Typical dosage at five times a week in this particular study. And, you know, I've kind of laid out some dosing here for you. It's two milligrams per vial, you know, you know, 10 units or 200 micrograms daily, five days out of seven. Hopefully it's on workout days and, uh, you know, half-life 48 to 72 hours. So you can go on 10 off 10. You can do it every other day if you want. Um, you know, I haven't seen anybody, you know, drop their blood blood sugars with using PEG MGF, but the caution's out there. So I'm putting it up here on the slide. On the horizon, things like BAM 15, I think, you know, real quick, nutrients, and then I'll stop. I know I got some questions. Um, rhodiola, think about it as an adaptogen to help moderate, you know, the peripheral adrenergic nervous system, typically 500 milligrams daily. Helps to maintain physical and mental performance. Your coma or Tongat Ali helps to keep the testosterone to cortisol ratio. You could also think about giving kids peptin to stimulate testosterone. But if you're working out, your coma is really good at keeping your testosterone as testosterone and not getting metabolized off. Works in men and women both. I gave you the dose at 400 milligrams. Really, 300 to 600 milligrams a day is good. Um, fenugreek extract. This was testofen. Uh, apps, you know, once again, why am I going through this? Because when people get under stress, they lose their test, they lose their test, they lose their anabolic drive. Um, they do improve lean body mass, decrease fat mass. This is at 600 milligrams daily for 12 weeks. This was 60 men. Uh, so improves testosterone, both total and free, as well as regulating sex hormone binding globulin versus placebo. Uh, and make sure you're taking in protein. You know, I, I know I just designed a protein powder that's, you know, organic hemp, organic pumpkin seed, organic watermelon, and essential amino acids. Why did I do it? Because everybody's getting allergic to pea protein and rice protein now. So you can reach out for things like beef protein, which is good. Egg is kind of tough now. I like collagen protein when it's added to other proteins. But if you're going to use, you know, semaglutide, terzepatide, one, 
get them drinking a protein drink every day. Two, they need a little bit of carb and don't have them intermittent fasting on it because you need them to store glycogen. You're trying to repair the way the body is signaling, store glycogen, utilize sugar. So they need a little bit of carb. I'm not talking about a lot of carbs, but at least 50, 60 grams a day. Come on, they need something. All right. And, uh, you know, once again, low allergen proteins, obviously get them on creatine. Uh, if they're having trouble with lean may mass, five grams a day is great. Helps to produce ATP, helps to volumize the muscle, add magnesium just to make sure you alkalinize. Probably the most studied ergogenic for anabolic drive of anything that's out there. There's nothing that has the studies on it that creatine does. Um, you could use beta alanine, um, but I'm going to go through beta alanine. Most people would find it uncomfortable, the average person, but people doing... Um, you know, the GLP ones, creatine's a good option as long as they're hydrating well and you got them on some magnesium, keep the pH alkaline in their urine. So pH is what I was, you know, kind of talking about. So I'm going to go ahead and answer questions. I hope you guys got the concept. It's not enough to just do GLP ones or GLP one dual agonists. Get, you know, used to, hey, can I use something for anabolic drive? If you're going to do that, Ipamorelin and CJC, great. As long as there's no cancer history, dose it once or twice a day. You could use MOTC to just augment the insulin glucose regulation, increase mitochondrial content. If you're particularly interested in lean, lean mass, creatine, PEG MGF, and these are just simple options. If either one of those don't work, meaning I can't give them, they don't qualify for giving, you know, semaglutide or terzepatide. Think of tesofensin or you can think of 5-amino-1-MQ. Tesofensin was an antidepressant that failed uh, in clinical trials, but did great for getting people to lose weight and improving their fatty acid oxidation. They lose an average of you know 9 to 10% um, body weight on tesofensin after about a month and a half, lowers their appetite, improves mood. And 5-amino-1-MQ is just increasing intracellular NAD by inhibiting the breakdown of it uh, and increasing your... Um, your mitochondrial capacity, but works great for weight loss, 5-amino, 1-MQ, or you could use something like Tessafensin. And maybe if Amy asked me back, I'll even talk about some of these other options for weight loss. Maybe a talk on non-GLP-1 related weight loss using peptides and other compounded prescriptions. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. Thanks everybody. Have a great evening.